All right, wireless network security. This is part two of our wireless lecture. Uh, with wireless network security, what we're worried about is making sure that our wireless networks become more secure, because inherently they are not secure. They were built with convenience in mind, not with security in mind. So some of the things we have to worry about here is we need to worry about how we're gonna correctly place our access points, because if you have the access point placed incorrectly, you're providing wireless signal in spaces you're not intending it to be. And if you have a signal out there, someone can get on your network. The other thing we need to worry about is our encryption of the data to ensure that the data is encrypted as it's in transit so people can't sniff it. Because if you think about this, it's just a radio wave. If someone's listening to that frequency, they can capture it. It's not inside a cable like it would be on a wired network. So if it's floating through the air, anybody can snatch that out of the air. If it's not encrypted, they're going to be able to read that as well. So wireless access point placement. Where do you put these things? Um, if you're using an ESS network, which is the extended server set, you need to carefully plan where the access points are going to be to ensure that the access points don't interfere with each other or with other people's network and that they still provide you adequate coverage. If you see the floor plan here I have, it takes four access points to cover this facility adequately. And you'll notice that they kind of go in an omnidirectional pattern because we said most of these access points work in an omnidirectional uh, pattern going in all directions. So you can see where the X's are on there, those four X's dictate where those access points are. The nice thing is we have coverage of the entire building. The bad thing with this particular layout is you can see that outside the building there is some overlapping going outside. So if somebody was parked just outside your building, they may be able to reach into your building through that wireless signal. The coverages need to overlap between the access points because that's going to give you uninterrupted roaming from one cell to the other. If you notice here, we have about a 10 to 15 percent overlap in each of these cells. That's where you have the two rings overcoming each other. If you overlapping coverage areas, should not use overlapping frequencies though. So remember I talked about that 1, 6, and 11? I don't want two of these to have ones that are touching each other, because if they do, we're going to have problems. So 1, 6, and 11 always has to be around. And the way we do that is with a honeycomb pattern. So again, I have 1, 6, and 11. If I do it, like on the left, see how 1 and 11 are touching each other, 1 and 6 are touching each other, but 1 and 1 don't touch each other, right? Same thing on the right with the honeycomb pattern. I have a 1 in the center, I have a 6 above it, and a 6 at the, uh, what is that, about 8 o'clock position and the 4 o'clock position, kind of a triangle, and then I have the 11s in the other positions. Notice no two 6s touch each other, no two 11s touch each other, no two 1s touch each other. And you can continue this, wireless, this, this honeycomb pattern throughout however big you want without having overlap that way. And that way you're going to have a good overlap of, of signal without overlapping frequency and causing interference. If you have two 11s touching each other, you're going to have interference and your network's going to have problems. Okay? So non-overlapping -overlap, coverage cells should be 10 to 15% overlap. That 10 to 15% we're talking about is this area right in here, where we have that 10 to 15% overlap. So as I'm walking through the building with my cell phone on Wi-Fi, I still have coverage. I'm starting to pick up 6 before I lose 11, and now I'm fully in 6. Right? So you want to get one before going to the other. These, while they're drawn as a um, hexagon, they really are circles. So that's where this overlap is here, this 1 in 11, or this 1 in 6. There's an overlap coverage there. Uh, for 5 gigahertz, identical channels should be separated by at least two cells of coverage instead of one cell. So here in 2.4, we only have three real channels that we can use, 1, 6, and 11. When we go into the 5 gigahertz span, we have channels ranging from 1 to about 150 that we use. So there's lots more channels in there that we have to choose from, and so we want to make sure we have at least two cells different. Um, for your Network Plus exam, they like to keep it a little easy for you, and they're going to give you stuff that's based on 2.4 gigahertz, 1, 6, and 11. So if you remember 1, 6, and 11, at least 10 to 15 percent overlap, no two cells touch each other, right? One can't touch one, one can touch 6 and 11. All right, securing your wireless networks. So you improperly, if you improperly install your wireless access points and routers, you're going to have huge security vulnerabilities. Think about this. If you put an Ethernet port sitting in your parking lot, anyone could drive up and hook up into your network, right? Well, wireless, that's exactly what you're doing. If you have wireless that's going outside your building walls, someone can access it. So you've got to make sure you secure it. There's a thing called war driving, which occurs when people drive around looking for unsecured wireless networks. And if they find them, sometimes they'll do what's called war chalking, where they'll actually write down symbols on a wall or a telephone pole near that building to tell other people of the characteristics of the access point they found. So I have three simple examples up here. 
if I'm driving around and I found an open node, I might write down with this backward C's that it's an open node. The SSID might say Starbucks because I found the Starbucks hotspot. And the bandwidth, I might find that they have a one megabit per second bandwidth connection. So I'd put a one down there. And that way anyone else who drove by could see that Starbucks has an open Wi-Fi with one megabit per second of service. Now, of course, everybody knows Starbucks has it, but if I'm driving through a neighborhood and I'm driving by John's house and I find John's Wi-Fi and there's no password, I might mark that so that other hackers know that they can use John's network. And by doing that, they can use that as a jumping off point to do bad and illegal things, and guess who's going to get caught? John, right? So, we, so you want to make sure your networks are secure. If it's a closed network, it's written with a circle. And a closed means that it is a, a password-protected network, and they haven't figured out the password yet. And so they'll put down, for instance, my network, Jason's network, Jason's Wi-Fi, and they would have a circle there because they don't know the password or couldn't figure it out. If they found a web access point, uh, WEP is a very weak encryption we're going to talk about later. It's called Wired Equivalent Privacy. Um, if they find that, they're going to go ahead and put that down with a big W because WEP, most hackers can crack in under three to five minutes. So for them, it's almost like an open connection. It works fairly well for them. And so we can get the same type of information. Uh, for the exam, you do not need to know symbols of war chalking. You do need to understand the concept that there is war driving where people are looking for these open po access points and war chalking where they're writing down their results for others to find. And it comes from the old hobo days in the 1930s when people would do that on the side of farmhouses like, hey, this lady here will give you a free meal or this person here won't, won't help you. And they would know where to go based on those symbols. So that's where this culture came up from. Uh, wireless threats. So wireless security has lots of different threats. One of them I just mentioned, web cracking, right? Wireless equivalent privacy can be cracked. Uh, there's lots of different utilities that will do this for WEP and WPA, which was the advancement of WEP called Wireless Protected Access. These utilities can capture the wireless packets and run a mathematical algorithm to determine the pre-shared key, which is the secret password to keep you off the network. If I get the secret password, guess what? I'm on your network. And like I said, for WEP, it usually takes under five minutes. Three to five minutes is the average time. Rogue access points. Rogue access points are set up by malicious users they set up an access point to lure legitimate users into connecting to their access point. Uh, these malicious users can then capture all the packets and data going through that access point because they control it. So for instance, if I go sit in the back of Starbucks and I set up my laptop as a rogue access point, I might set it up where it says Starbucks free Wi-Fi. And you're going to connect to it because you're in Starbucks and you're thinking there's free Wi-Fi, right? And if you connect to me, I'm going to give you internet access through like a cellular modem, but as you're going through my computer, which is acting as the access point, I'm collecting all your data, all your usernames, all your passwords, all that good stuff. That's why you have to be really careful about wireless in public places. Um, how many times have you been on an airplane and you're looking for free Wi-Fi? And most airports don't have free Wi-Fi. But you find one that says, you know, BWI free Wi-Fi, you connect to it, and now you're getting free Wi-Fi sweet. Well, if you're doing your banking on there, I may now have your password, right? So you don't want to do that. You want to be careful about that. MAC address filtering. We talked about this earlier with switches, uh, but you can configure your access points to do MAC filtering as well. So when you try to connect to the access point, it's going to look at your MAC address and determine whether or not it's going to let you on based on that MAC address. And that'll be a permit or a deny statement. The problem with this is MAC filtering is fairly easy to overcome. You can falsify your MAC address using freely available tools on the internet. If you're using Windows, there's a program called MAC Address Changer. If you're using OSX or a Macintosh machine, you can download something like Mac Daddy X, and it literally takes about 10 seconds to change your MAC address. So if you're doing things based on a deny statement of this guy was a problem, I'm going to deny him, it does not take long for him to get a new MAC address and cause problems in your network again. So generally, you're going to have to do allows only, which is fine if you have a couple of devices on your network. But if you're like me, I've got 20 or 30 devices in my house. Having to put the MAC address in for each one of those takes a lot of time. The other problem with that is any good hacker is able to sniff all that traffic going through the air anyway. And they're going to see source and destination MAC addresses flying through the air. So all I have to do is grab Michelle's MAC address from her laptop that's authorized on the network, and now I became Michelle. And now I'm on the network and the access point thinks I'm allowed because I use her MAC address. So it, it does provide some ability for security, but it's not great and it's pretty easy to overcome. It'll stop the general population. It's not going to stop somebody who knows what they're doing. Now, for the Network Plus exam, MAC filtering is good, right? Um, real world, you may or may not want to use it on a wireless network because, again, it's pretty easy to overcome. 
disabling your SSID broadcast. Again, this is another thing that the Network Plus exam says is a good thing to do from security. In reality, knowledgeable users can easily find the SID um, that is using wireless sniffing tools, just like I can find that MAC address. Because every time Michelle is connecting to the network and talking to it, it's saying source MAC, destination MAC, destination MAC is for this SSID. Um, and it will still be out there. The only difference is that the access point will not broadcast its name. And by that, I mean when you go into your control panel and you try to connect to a, a wireless network in Windows, um, you know how you get that whole list of all the available networks that you see? You won't see this network if you disable the broadcast. So somebody who doesn't know what they're doing won't see your network. Somebody who does know what they're doing, they'll find it pretty quickly. But again, um, it's one additional step to help protect your network. It's not the most effective, but it does work some of the time. Network authentication. This stuff actually does work. <laughs> IEEE 802.1x. We talked about this earlier with switches. Uh, each wireless user can authenticate using their own credentials this way. It's not exclusively used for wireless networks. We use this with wired networks as well. And we talked about this before, the fact that our supplicant can then request access to the authenticator, which was the switch, or in our case, the wireless access point, to gain access to the network. Um, usually you're going to use things like TACUS and RADIUS uh, for this, and we'll talk about those later on as well. Uh, the same type of authentication works for wired networks and wireless networks. So it gives you the ability to use this on both networks very well. And it provides encryption communications between your client and your switch. The other way that we do things, and the most commonly used one, is a pre-shared key. Both your access point and your wireless client will utilize the same key for encryption by using a pre-shared key. The problem with this, though, is the scalability issue. So if we have a large network and we all have to know the key, um, but we decided that you know Michelle gets fired and she's not working here anymore, we've got to change the key now on 300 machines and 300 people's heads, right? Because we're all using the same key. So all users have to know the same key to connect, which is makes it easy for configuration, but as soon as we need to scale, it becomes an issue. So the first way that we, we can do that pre-shared key is WEP. It was the original standard in 802.11, so really, really old. Uh, it was claimed to be as secure as wired networks. Uh, it stands for Wired Equivalent Privacy. It is a static 40-bit WEP key is what it started out as. Nowadays, we can use a 64 or 128-bit key. Longer bit keys mean it's a longer and stronger password. These passwords were written in hexadecimal format, so they were hard for people to remember. So often people wrote them down, which again is another security issue. And your access point and your client both have to use the same pre-shared key to make sure you connect because we're using a pre-shared key. We're sharing the same key. The problem is it has relatively weak security. And the reason why is this initialization vector. It has a 24-bit initialization vector, which is sent in clear text. So if I sit there on the network and I listen for long enough, I can collect enough initialization vectors. I run it through an algorithm, and it takes about three minutes, and it will pop back to me what the password is. Okay? So it can be compromised by a brute force attack. Multiple utilities are out there to crack it in just a few minutes. Things like Aircrack NG, as part of Kali Linux, work really well for this. Um, so you don't want to be using WEP in your networks. It's very, very insecure uh, these days. So after WEP was found to be having a problem, they decided to add WPA, which is Wi-Fi Protected Access. Um, this one has a temporal key, in, in, yeah, temporal key integrity protocol, or TKIP, and it uses a 48-bit initialization vector instead of a 24-bit initialization vector. Okay? So we doubled the length of that string. That makes it more secure. Unfortunately, it still uses only a 48-bit initialization vector, so it just takes us a little bit longer to crack. Especially with today's uh, technology that we have, we can crack it fairly quickly as well. Uh, it also uses what's called the Message Integrity Check, or MIC, which confirms that data wasn't changed in transit. So it uses a hash value to ensure that everything is good. Uh, users here can use Enterprise Mode as well, where the users are required to authenticate before exchanging keys, similar to 802.1x. And the keys between the client and the access point are temporary. So with enterprise mode, we're not all using the same pre-shared key anymore, which is a good benefit. So then we came out with WPA2, which was an enhancement to the original WPA. Um, it actually is known as the standard 802.11i, okay, where we talked about A, B, G, N, and AC. I specifically was a standard that said that we would have stronger encryption and integrity checking. And the way we did that was WPA2. 
It uses CCMP, which is our counter mode with cipher block chaining message authentication code protocol for your integrity checking. That's a lot of words to say a type of hash that we were using. Um, it uses advanced encryption systems as well, AES, for data encryption, and it uses a 128-bit key or above. Some networks will actually use a 256-bit key. 128-bit key at this time, WPA has not been broken by brute force. The only way they break into WPA2 networks is you have a weak password, okay? Because the password can be anything you want. So if you make your password puppy, I'm going to crack it pretty darn quickly. If you make it with uppercase, lowercase, numbers, letters, special characters, and it's 14 characters long, I'm not getting in there for months to years, and I'm going to move on to somebody else, okay? So the nice thing about this is it does support enterprise mode as well, so you can do centralized user authentication uh, where everybody has their own username and password, which scales really well, so when I fire Michelle, I just take her name out of the database, right? And we all can still keep going on with our day. It also, for home users, does support personal mode where you have a personal uh, pre-shared key for all users which is probably what you're using at home. Um, so most people use at home is WPA2 with a good, long, strong password, and that's going to give you good encryption even though everybody knows your password, right? And that is wireless security.